Mary, do you want to put the link in again for the collaborative notes since you have it queued up there? And um, for those that have joined since you said put that in. I remain. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Um, we'll get the uh, Mary's just put in the link to the collaborative notes. Um, and uh, that that will be useful because I'll refer to it a couple of things that are in the notes document in my kind of introductory comments. Uh, so it's useful if you have access to it. Um, just a couple of reminders. So uh, as you probably no doubt have been told, the sessions will be recorded. Um, so um, bear that in mind if you um, w want to uh, go on audio or otherwise uh, comment in the chat. Um, we, uh, with the collaborative notes, uh, as I said, the link is there. Um, Bear in mind now what I just forgot when Mary highlighted <laughs> um, the disadvantages of being old. My memory banks are short. I'll, I'll think of it. Um, so what I thought I would do is just take a couple of minutes to highlight the, um, the context for the infectious disease community of practice or COP. Ah, there Natalie reminded me. Please mute yourselves if you're not talking. <laughs> um, and the uh, community of practice was originally scheduled to, or the infectious disease BOF uh, was originally scheduled for the Melbourne plenary, um, which uh, was changed for reasons we all are aware of. And then subsequently uh, there was a BOF at uh, P16 last November. And we had a good discussion of the basic uh, community of practice idea. Uh, and a small task group was uh, spun out to create the initial case statement for the community of practice. So that was, uh, that was done. And that brought us to uh, today's call. Um, the community of practice uh, governance document, which is what determines how a community of practice is created is linked to in the uh, notes. And the draft case statement is also there. Useful to refer to the case statement or have it open if you can during the conversation because uh, some of the things that are discussed will um, will come back, especially in, if you have that context in front of you. Um, Priyanka will talk a little bit more coming up on uh, more details about uh, the case statement, uh, but I'll just highlight a couple of uh, elements from that document. Um, so this is version two, so it's based on feedback that we got from uh, the RDA uh, community uh, tab in particular. Uh, so it's a little bit different than the one that you will have seen before. Uh, it highlights the objectives as you'll see in the context, especially in the COVID-19 pandemic, and the uh, desire to have a conversation globally around infectious disease. So we have a few objectives there, uh, the value proposition, and then engagement with existing work in the area. And I did want to highlight that one. And I'll also, for those that have the notes open, further down, I've put in a screen grab from an earlier session yesterday uh, from the uh, interest group for agricultural data. Um, and it may be hard to see the details there, but essentially what that diagram shows, I think it's down at the top of page four in our collaborative notes document. Um, it's not obvious in here because it was a build, but there's multicolored circles uh, in the back of background of this document, and that represents external community groups that are also involved in uh, agricultural data in this context. And that includes a group like Godan, which probably a lot of RDA colleagues have heard of. Um, so IGAD is an, another example of a longer standing uh, interest group that has had a whole a wealth of activity that has taken place, and that's depicted with the green uh, jigsaw puzzle elements in the middle um, and the crop 
data interoperability working group is an example of a new one that's coming in. So I wanted to show this because when I listened to the session yesterday, I thought it was a particularly good description of RDA's intention with the community of practice. And that is to take, to intersect both with the work of external groups, as well as the work of internal facing RDA interest groups and working groups. And then that engagement with existing work in the area in the case statement, you'll see mention of groups like HDR UK, the WHO, GLOPEDAR. So these are external facing groups that are focused on infectious disease. Uh, ones like ICO, uh, ICOTA that are focused particularly on COVID. Um, so I wanted to highlight that the, the goal of a community of practice uh, is to facilitate that intersection in particular. Um, so I really want you to kind of hold on to that idea as we move forward with our conversation. So unlike the interest group for agricultural data, the community of uh, infectious disease community of practice is nascent. It emerged out of the uh, COVID-19 working group, which developed the guidelines uh, for COVID-19 data sharing. And it was thought that the, that effort uh, that many of you are aware of was very promising and would help to, um, to, uh, to generate additional interest in something like an infectious disease community of practice. So that's what's brought us uh, here today. Um, and since I mentioned the emergence of this community of practice, especially through the efforts of Priyanka, um, I, we thought it would be useful to just give you a little bit of a background and update um, on the RDA COVID-19 working group, which I mentioned. Uh, so to do that, uh, Natalie Harrower will provide a, a brief description and Natalie's um, been in a few meetings in RDA. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> so, uh, and as she says in her day job, she's the director of the Digital Repository of Ireland. Um, and uh, more on her bio is there in our shared notes. So I'm gonna let uh, Natalie go ahead and share her screen. Thanks, Mark. Take the mic. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yep. Great, okay, I will start with the sharing and see if that works. Um, just maybe stay on for a sec, Mark. Is that, are you seeing what we should be seeing? Yes. And I, uh, don't be shy. Other, uh, the Natalie M and Alex and Priyanka kind of get, get things queued up, um, and ready to go, uh, when you're up next. Uh, so yeah, you're good to go, Natalie. Okay, great. Thanks for the introduction, Mark. Hi everyone. I was just doing a quick, quick look at the people that have, uh, joined the session today. Uh, to see, and I know that some of you were part of this working group, so this will be a, a bit of a recap for you. Um, uh, but for the others, this is a just a, a bit of a sense of where uh, one of the one of the big motivators for building this community of practice. So, this is a, a quick presentation on the RDA COVID nineteen working group, um, kind of recap of what we did and some updates of what's happened since. So, for those of you that were not involved. Um, this was a, a very kind of special type of working group because normally they're built in a grassroots way. A member suggests something and it goes through all the RDA governance. But in this case, the European Commission actually came to the Research Data Alliance at the very kind of beginning of when the pandemic was hitting um, Europe. And this was about a year ago now, just over a year ago, and asked RDA if they would put together a group to build recommendations and guidelines on sharing COVID-19 research data from all different kinds of domains. So in a very quick period of time, 600 RDA members signed up and this recruited some new people into RDA as well. Out of those 600, about 160 of them were active contributors to, to writing this document. Uh, we had seven co-chairs, uh, about double that number of moderators and eight different groups that, that split up into these smaller groups inside the working group. And between April and June of last year, we released seven different versions of the guidelines and recommendations, each in consultation period, take new feedback in, rewrite it. It was kind of uh, exhausting, but it was also really exhilarating to put, to put one's energy towards um, those early efforts around the pandemic. 
Uh, we had meetings in all the time zones, um, which was quite challenging, but also really useful because you, you go to sleep, you wake up, and your colleagues in across the world have written something. Uh, and then we also had weekly webinar updates. Uh, many outputs came out of this in addition to the document. There's a Zotero library, there's mind maps and navigation tools, infographics, that sort of thing to try to help people get through it. And in the end, we had a 143-page document, longer than we wanted, but I'll show you a bit of the detail so you can see why it needed to be that long, but there is an executive summary of that. So uh, just to back up a, get, a bit, how did this group come about? Uh, so essentially, very critical need to share data as rapidly as possible. When the pandemic started, we all know the story of the sequencing of the genome and when that got out and, and that sort of thing. But at the same time, there's this critical need, but we don't have any harmonized standards for sharing COVID-19 data or uh, a lot of infectious disease data, which is why we're looking at this community of practice now. Um, so uh, what we had to find were or create were some guidelines that could try to uh, get this data sharing going in a timely fashion, uh, but also with a certain degree of precision. So there's a balance between those two things, and that's what researchers were facing and are still facing, really. The objectives, I'll simplify these. There's a lot of text here, but really it was to write high-level recommendations that could go to funders and policy makers to maximize the sharing of data and to try to um, support that for researchers and clinicians and, and others working in the area but also to write detailed guidelines to researchers to say, this is how you can share your data, where and using what kinds of standards that'll make it more usable, reusable, understandable by others. But importantly, if you see the one that I circled there, 1.2, um, the objective was also to, to build this uh, with potential future global health emergencies in mind to act as a blueprint for further work that we could do. So this is the part that we're getting to now by trying to build this community of practice. For the RDA COVID-19 working group, very collaborative uh, cross-disciplinary effort. So we had sub-working groups uh, looking at clinical data, uh, a group looking at omics, one on epi epidemiology and one on the social sciences. And then we also had at the bottom here, you see these cross-cutting groups that brought in community issues, also looked at research uh, software in addition to data and other outputs. Um, we had uh, input on indigenous data sharing guidelines, and also legal and ethical considerations that cut across many of these different areas. And if we do a little bit of a dive, when I said before that there were, was quite a lot of detail, I'll show you a page pulled out of the omics section. So this is section 4.4.2, guidelines for host genomics data, and subsection 4.4.2.2. So quite, um, quite ordered and detailed. And here you can see that recommendations on which repositories to use for different kinds of data. So it, it goes down to this very granular. We also had a series of overarching recommendations. There was an editorial team that was working with all of the groups on a weekly basis to try to pull together these different outputs. Um, and what we started to see over time is that the eight different groups, there were certain recommendations that were coming out of all of them quite consistently, similar kinds of things. So we had a section in the document that looks at these kind of overarching or key recommendations. And I won't go through them, look at the document or these, these slides I can share and you can look at them later. But what you'll see here are um, a lot of recommendations that are really around um, open science, around fair data sharing, the use of trustworthy data repositories, um, uh, the desire to make your data as open as possible in whenever that is, uh, whenever you're able to, these kinds of things. So. Um, key areas that the Research Data Alliance deals with, but their iteration or their importance in the midst of this global health emergency became even clearer. Uh, since that point, so this was a June 30th that we put out the final release, and um, it was a collective sigh of relief because people could get a little bit of their lives back at this point. So again, uh, I don't think the community of practice will work with the same level of urgency um, but uh, that's what we were dealing with in that moment. And since then, there's been a lot of, of work going on by the group itself and by subgroups to, to release further outputs. Here's just a few um, that are in peer-reviewed uh, journal articles, relatively recent. So the group wrote 
uh, an article that kind of summarized the, the key highlights, something to get it out there and to just dis disseminate better to welcome open research. Uh, there's a new version of that coming out soon. Um, there was a paper done that looked at the way that the group actually worked from a, a kind of a sociological perspective using this concept of radical collaboration. Uh, that's pending publication in open research. Um, and then uh, we also uh, penned a, a kind of quick letter to nature in response to an article that came up there saying, hey, we really need data sharing guidelines. So that's motivated us to let them know that in fact they do exist and we put those in context. Um, there are other articles that have come out. Again, this is just a, a smattering of a, a couple of them here that are on their way. Uh, one bottom left emerging from the legal and ethical considerations group. Um, but this again is just the tip of the iceberg. So there are a number of preprints and other uh, outputs, especially from the epidemiology group uh, and others. And if you go to the value of RDA for COVID site there, um, you can just search it on the on the RDA site and you'll find it quite easily. You can see all of these documents collected together on that particular page. And then the one last thing I wanted to say is uh, uh, we've, we've also looked at ways to um, translate or kind of, re, uh, sort of shorten in a sense this, this document so it can target different communities. And there's a paper that you'll also find on that value for RDA site that uh, Ingrid Dilo and I, one of uh, the co-chairs from the group, put together that's focused on what policymakers can do. What are the kind of policy implications or recommendations that come out of this document? And uh, RDA is uh, hosting with the OECD this Friday as a co-located event with the plenary, um, a really interesting event that you might want to take a look at. We have something like uh, 17 speakers, all giving very short talks from all across different areas of uh, research data sharing, not not specifically to do with our guidelines, but in uh, working in kind of um, uh, ways that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It starts with a C, not collaborative. Um, anyway, similar ways. So you could uh, join us at that event possibly, and you'll see that on the RDA plenary website on the co-located page. And I think that's my last slide. I'll stop sharing and everybody heard me. We heard you. And okay. you, you were probably thinking of complimentary, maybe. Thank you. I knew it. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> we've seen each other so much the last few days. We're thinking the same. You're like reading my mind and feeling my words and things. You should have <laughs> voice on and just said complimentary. <laughs> um, okay. Thanks, Natalie. Thank Good to see the additional work that's uh, come. Uh, mm -hmm. since the, the group uh, finished up the initial uh, data sharing guidelines. So thanks for that. Any questions or comments? I noticed Priyanka has encouraged folks to uh, put any uh, items in the chat or Q&A if you have questions. Anything in particular for Natalie on the original COVID-19 data sharing efforts before we go to the next one? Okay, we will... Can I ask a question? Um, just to keep the discussion uh, flowing into the next part of the agenda as well, Natalie and Mark, are there anything? Are, are there any sp specific expectations that you have from this community of practice in terms of the lessons that we learned from the COVID nineteen working group? Anything that we could have done? I mean, we did a really good job. <laughs> I'm going to say that. But anything different that we could have done in that working group that you'd like to see in the community of practice? Natalie, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Uh, I don't know about differently, but I will say that we brought together significantly different domains into this one group, which I think is um, a really important point. And the groups kind of, because this happened under such pressure, um, I, I joined this whole group about one weekend, and I thought I had missed tons. And I realized it was only one weekend by the time that I joined. That's how quickly it was working. Um, I think, I just think, um, you know, the, the, the subgroups, if you're working on different topics, can go off in different kinds of directions, uh, which makes sense. So efforts to kind of make sure that you can can rein those back in towards whatever your common purpose is, is, is the thing. So with something like the community of practice, the kind of broadening out the, the focus, right? We had a very specific one with the, uh, the COVID-19 work. 
this is going to look a little more broadly, but I imagine it's going to have input from as many, if not more, disciplines and domains. So fighting off um, a, a good sized piece of work to chew, <laughs> split my metaphor there, or, uh, uh, is, a, is a good thing to do in the beginning. That's, that's what comes to mind first. Mark? Yeah, the only other comment I would make, and it's so challenging uh, at the best of times, and it's uh, impossible in a pandemic, is to engage the practitioners more directly. Um, so I think the going forward with the infectious disease community of practice, um, I think we it would be beneficial for the group to strategize over how we can better engage um, whether it's clinicians or virologists or whatever the case may be in um, in the work of this group. And I think that will partly come as we, we see focus. So that would be the only comment I would make. Mark, maybe one just quick thought on that. I know the um, the main COVID guidelines that were put together were principally in a, in a textual written form. I wonder if it might be useful to see what kind of outputs other than text could be useful for practitioners. So whether it's you know tools that are just easy to navigate because they're in a more visual format, or whether it really is uh, you know things like uh, software or template documents, things that would be sort of, of you know practical utility for people to pick up and just run with. Yeah, yeah, it's a good good point, Alexander. And we did. Um, I think I might have seen Rob Hooft on the on the call. Um, there were two additional three additional visualizations. One was a simple infographic, which Natalie showed elements of in her slide deck. A uh, second one was a, a visual mind map, which kind of duplicated the, the guidelines in a more visual way, but uh, with all of the appropriate text uh, searchable and added in. And then Rob and the team at Elixir work have a a platform to facilitate uh, data planning, where uh, research data sharing and planning, um, and uh, we cloned that and created a, again, a full copy of the guidelines in the context, so that you could come in and create a, a national or jurisdictional version of the guidelines or simplified version. Um, and if Rob is on the call, he can always put a link into that because I'm blanking. It's the tool is called the DS Wizard or Data Stewardship Wizard. Um, and that one, I think we, we haven't really highlighted enough because I think it has a great deal of promise in, in taking uh, specific elements of the guidelines and adding in the national context, whether it's legal, uh, privacy, uh, clinical, other kinds of contexts that would be different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So that the data stewardship wizard, I think, uh, is a very valuable tool. And Rob and his team uh, have done a, a great deal of uh, good work on producing a tool that would allow us to produce other versions of the guidelines. OK. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely encourage you, if you do have questions, I can facilitate a connection to Rob and his team if you have questions about how best to make use of that data stewardship wizard. I think it is a very good tool, but it uh, should be fairly self-explanatory when you go in in terms of how to clone it and and make your own copies. Um, so, and I'm not sure if Natalie, I know Natalie Myers dropped in and out. Are you on the call, Natalie? Yes, I am. Thanks, Mark. You're here? All right. Um, I'll let you Go ahead. I'm just going to, if you want to go ahead and share your slides. So we're going to have two kind of case studies from our colleagues, uh, Natalie Meyer and Alexander um, Bernier. And Natalie's going to go first. Natalie's the e-research librarian at the Navari Center for Digital Scholarship at the University of Notre Dame. Um, so she is going to uh, talk to us about her particular case studies. Natalie? Am I sharing your slides or you? I think I am. Let's see how it goes. We've got them here if we need it. It's, um, we're so used to being on virtual platforms, but the adjustment to different ones is sometimes substantial.
Okay, can you see my screen? No, you cannot. Let's try one more time. Uh, okay, that is not working. Um, Natalie Harrower, can you share them from the link? I will certainly try. <laughs> Thank you. I put it in the chat. Let's see. Uh, does that seem, is that That's it? That's it. It should be a brown blob. How about that? There we go. Perfecto. It's very artistic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I um, am really appreciative of the opportunity to share with you a couple of case studies from the Naveri Family Center for Digital Scholarship at the University of Notre Dame. Um, you'll notice on the uh, first slide that there is a link to um, a paper associated to one of these um, uh Case studies, um, that case study is uh, one that um, if you could paste that into the chat, that would be helpful. If that is difficult, no problem. Um, I think I can do it. Um, there's also a companion poster that was presented at Cold Spring Harbor for those who would be interested in digging in more deeply after the talk. Um, if we go to the next slide, you can see how this kind of work is a team effort. Um, the second from the far right is uh, our PhD candidate and um, graduate student TA hosted in my Center for Digital Scholarship. If we move to the next slide, we'll see more about him. Um, this is Dave Malik. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see how this work started before Dave even joined us uh, for his graduate studies um, back when he was at Cold Spring Harbor. So this kind of work doesn't happen overnight, neither does the idea for it happen overnight. Um, next slide. What we can uh, see is that in the study of infectious disease, um, when we look at reasons why people with certain infectious diseases um, have mortality events, um, we can begin to triage or prioritize those in accordance to um, what actually causes the mortality event and what kind of mitigations or treatments might be possible. If we move on to the next slide, we can see a little bit about the um, underlying thing we used in this study, the metabarcode, um, to look at gene regions uh, affiliated with um, HIV deaths. And if we move down, we can see how those barcodes are typically made into uh, OTU or ASV tables. And on the next slide, you can see how those relate to um, the environment, how we can compare barcodes at the environmental label, level um, to get a feel for which um, barcodes or species are present in which places and with which other species or um, you could think of them as environmental companions. Next slide, we can see how we can look for rare species or understudied species within a large number of data sets very quickly using the metabarcode. On the next slide, we see how C neoformans or cry Cryptococcus neoformans um, was one of the three yeasts we used to calibrate this study. We did that because it was kind of middlingly available. Um, it's an opportunistic yeast. Um, it's found in a lot of places, but it's understudied. If we move on, you can see what it looks like. Um, this is a colorized image of C. neoformans, and you get a little information here about how this little troublemaker um, is a big problem for HIV patients and um, others who, when this opportunistic yeast um, becomes part of respiratory infection, it can be a deadly killer. Next slide. 
Um, we can see next our pipeline for how we searched by sequence, looked for scientific papers that the uh, gene sequence and its companion organism might be found in. And even if that species wasn't mentioned by name, but only by barcode. And then we used some topic modeling and an NLP um, random for a statistical method to validate that topic model in order to learn more about Cryptococcus neoformans, what its companions are and where it is. Next slide. We were looking for the sequence, move on next. And um, we found that um, we could look for those sequences by using reciprocal BLAST on a subset of uh, SRA data sets. We ran two searches and we downloaded each of uh, 1,380 data sets over each query and we BLASTed those. This generated a list of SRAs we could turn into papers and um, we were able to um, get a percent identity value of about 98%, which is great, move on. And um, after finding those data sets, um, what we did, if you look on the next slide, is um, if we couldn't, if we could grab the paper through the SRA data set um, via NCBI and PubMed, we were golden, but the paper isn't always attached. So then we had two other strategies. If it mentioned the SRA, the bio project or other reference, we could get it that way. Other times we had to triangulate by author and publishing date, that was tedious. And um, the next slide shows uh, what our end results were and how we then use the topic model um, to uh, build on a bag of words. And the next slide shows how um, we needed to validate that with papers that had no evidence of or no presence of C neoformants um, so that we could distinguish between positive and negative papers for validation. Um, that was actually a time consuming part of the process too. Um, you wouldn't think it would be such a big deal to go look for papers that make sense for your project that don't mention your species, but that turned out to be something that uh, we had to spend a little time thinking around. Next slide. Um, what we can see is how um, the word counts in the positive papers um, show the kind of environments um, where uh, C. neoformans was found. On the next slide, we can see um, how the word counts in each topic um, binned out and um, the way that our model um, handled perplexity and coherence um, helped us determine the number of topics we would work with. And you can see a little bit about how those naturally bend. On the next slide um, and the subsequent one after that, you can see how Dondre Thompson helped us with our random forest validation. This classifier helped us validate our uh, LDA results. And with that, um, we were able to um, look at two of the three topics dominated by positive hits and one dominated by negative hits. And uh, John Dre was an undergraduate who joined us from a computing science class, and he learned to use the technique through this project. On the next slide, you can see how um, we had to um, generate um, our rock curve and um, how on the subsequent slide, you'll see the way that uh, with our limited number of papers related to Cryptococcus neoformans um, worked out. Um, here we see that it was um, the kind of study where had there been more papers about Cryptococcus neoformans, it would have been better for validating our model, but there simply aren't any. We got all the ones that were written and this was all we had to work with because it's an understudied yeast in field studies. Next slide. And so that brings us to GIS. If something's understudied, but you want to know more about where it lives, even if it's an opportunistic yeast like C. neoformans and why it kills people, 
Um, what we found with C. neoformans was that it primarily been associated with HIV deaths um, in the continent of Africa, but um, we began to see it involved in deaths and uh, disease in the Pacific Northwest related to forestry. Um, by analyzing uh, the sampling locations that were derived for each record, we could learn a little bit more about C. neoformans and uh, get a feel for the substrate classes at each sample location and how together the locations show a global distribution of C. neoformans. It's likely these locations have a sampling bias, um, but here we can see how this yeast is everywhere, but it's particular about where it kills. Next slide. Um, so what are our meta barcode NLP conclusions? Um, the positive topic associations uh, worked well um, that um, allowed us to create associations between rhizospheres and decomposing wood and the kind of soils where we would anticipate finding C. neoformans. Our microaverage was above random. Um, our classifier needs more training. So we think with more studied species, um, we'll get even more performant results. And the analysis and method itself, we believe, is inherently expandable. So let's look. I think I've got a couple minutes left. We're going to shift gears. And you might be thinking to yourselves, well, OK, what about the pandemic we have right now? We use some of the same techniques to text mine the CORD19 data set using a homegrown tool we have that we affectionately call the Distant Reader. It's available at distantreader.org. I'm going to type that in the chat real quick. And the code for that is open source. So everything I see, you could try at home. Next slide. The CORD19 data set is also publicly available through the Allen Institute. And in the summer of 2019, we worked on a text mining project using Distant Reader and the CORD19 data set um, to uh, try out some of the NLP strategies we had learned with the C. neoformans work. Next slide. And we were fortunate to receive a grant from the COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortium. I want to emphasize this resource. And I think that knowledge about resources like this and its community of knowledge exchange are really important as we establish a community of practice for infectious disease like this one at RDA. The COVID-19 HPC Consortium is a unique public-private effort spearheaded by the United States White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy and IBM. It brings together federal government, industry, and academic leaders from all over the world to share high-performance computing resources. We were fortunate to receive awards to run on Exceed and later on um, Microsoft AI for Good um, Azure resources. Next slide. So we could text mine the CORE 19 data set and begin to look at ways to delve into it, even though the data set itself is not truly fair or findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable yet. Um, processing the metadata in CORD19 meaningfully alongside our bag of words um, from the heterogeneous text indexed by CORD19 was non-trivial. It demands a lot of attention to workflow, sorting, and ranking fe features. Um, and we also had some trouble outputting fair analysis of the CORD19. Increasingly ample as the CORD19 data set grew from 14,000 articles when we were first working with it to um, nearly 200,000 and just over today, I believe. Uh, next. And this brings us back to the community of practice and how together we can look at issues like this one in order to share techniques, skills, and ways to uptrain one another, both on the high performance computing methods we need that are easier to share and learn together, next slide, but also how we can work together to verify the content, not just of the data sets we share, but the analysis that we out.
We needed to better offer and leverage DOIs, ROARs, and PIDs in order to make our analysis uh, more reusable and more uh, citable. We needed ways to provide DOIs into our analysis data. But, um, with the uh, final slide, um, what I'd like to do is just thank everyone on the teams who worked on this, um, from Mike Fender at our genomics core facility on the far right, to Max Sisk on the far left who did our GIS, Eric Morgan who authored the distant reader on the far left bottom, and everyone in the middle top of the slide, especially Dave Mullick, who worked to uh, vet our processes all along the way. Um, thank you for listening, and I hope these are examples of things that we can share together in future. Thanks, Natalie. It's great to see not just the team effort, but also the the um, the strengths that good, strong data sharing, fair practices, and all the things that we promote in RDA come to the practitioners. Yeah, it's important, and I think what we learned was um, it's easy to implement fair in a system that you built for that purpose it's harder when you're cobbling together a lot of things quickly so we really had to make an effort to eat our own dog food unfair and it meant that we had to be constantly rethinking the ways that um, we shared our outputs and our software and at what points in the process. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be in this community of practice um, so we can all get better at this together. Indeed. All right, thanks, Natalie. So our second, Thank you, Mark. Our second case study comes from uh, Alexander Bernier. Alexander was on our original um, COVID-19 uh, legal and ethical uh, group uh, put a lot of time and effort into uh, various aspects of that. And uh, Alex is a Canadian lawyer and academic associate at the Center for Genomics and Policy at McGill University. Over to you, Alexander. Well, thank you. For, thank you for having me. Um, before I start, can everyone see my desktop? Is it is it showing correctly? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you, just a moment, let me open this up, about governance tools for transnational data comps. Um, so, and what do I mean by... Sorry, Alex, not to, I, I hate to, uh, the, what we're seeing is your slide uh, navigation view. We don't see mm -hmm. the, uh, so your slides are kind of cut off. Uh, oh, um, I didn't need uh, to maximize or show us. Just a second. Let me see if this works. We also have a bit of echo coming off of you, um, Alexander. Not sure if you might have the uh, Juno open in multiple browser windows or. No, it's strange. It's only open in the one window here. I'll try sharing this again. Okay. Um, does this work? Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can wow. see the slide, yeah. Yeah, that's better. The slide, okay, brilliant. Well, then I, I guess I'll, I'll move forward with that. Um, so the first question you might have is, um, when we talk about data governance, uh, why is it important? And the, the issue that the data governance in this context is trying to resolve is the issue of normative interoperability. So many of you being scientists or computer scientists are probably used to dealing with questions of technical interoperability, which roughly refer to how can we compare data sets meaningfully if they've been generated under different conditions. Um, and normative interoperability is a similar concept in a legal, ethical, or governance uh, situation or context. And it essentially thinks about if data sets are coming from different traditions of data governance, uh, different contexts of data collection and processing, and different legal or ethical regimes, how can we bring them together so that they can be meaningfully used and compared without breaching rules, laws, or requirements of one jurisdiction, place, or another? Um, and the message that I'm gonna try and get across today is that governance tools play an extremely important uh, role in making this happen. Um, so when we talk about uh, normative interoperability, we, we talk about a lot of different um, sort of normative contexts. And the, the main one that you might think of is uh, law. So in the traditional kind of prescriptive sense, what you can and can't do with data 
in a particular setting. Uh, data protection is one of the big ones that uh, you might think of, but there's others as well, such as medical confidentiality requirements and such. Um, from there, there are a number of other legal and ethical regimes that can apply. So these include things like local legal um, rules regarding intellectual property that might be put in place by a particular institution or a particular group of researchers. It can also mean things like research ethics uh, consent materials, so the specific things that individuals have agreed to do with their data. Um, and so the first lesson that we might glean with regard to this is that the barriers that arise are different for legacy data and uh, prospective data. So the, the kinds of problems that one might encounter differ if the data is being generated for a particular use, whereas um, they, they might be a lot more complex if someone wants to take a large number of pre-existing data sets and bring them together for a new use purpose. Um, and one thing that's important to remember is that in navigating these barriers and really in creating common data infrastructure for the health community, for the scientific community, um, that the, the actual communities and the institutions involved in these data sharing exchanges, um, even perhaps more so than individual groups of researchers, have a big role to play in facilitating this process. Um, so the first kind of sort of, uh, you know, governance that I'm going to talk about is perspective data governance um, and, and how can that be achieved and some traditional approaches that uh, that help happen and that have been helpful in health consortia are the use of things like standardized consent forms uh, data governance practices that are sort of agreed to from the outset uh, meaning that it is much easier to sort of come up with a data governance model um, get a large group of different institutions on board and then implement than it is to sequence or collect data and then uh, sort of try and build the wheels while the train is already in motion, so to speak. Um, other tools that are extremely useful in this context are common consent practices, common data management practices that have already been devised by either standard setting bodies or consortia such as the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. Um, and so the, in, in the prospective context, it's often important to think about what kinds of uses the data will be put to, and then how to minimize the barriers that arise in actually doing so, both at the contractual level, at the institutional level, and at the ethical level. Um, regarding legacy data, options naturally become more limited in the sense that there are already a number of competing normative orders uh, that apply to the different data sets. So the, data's, the data arises from a number of different silos and usually certain governance conditions will have been imposed through a large number of different documents. You, think, you can think of intellectual property, contracts, institutional policies, and so on. And then it becomes a question of seeing how they can be reused for secondary purposes. So this can look like anything from uh, comparative documentation, really a consent filter, if you will, to go look at the different data and say, well, we can't change the permissions that are applicable to this information, but maybe we can look at the different permissions and see where there might be some overlap, see where maybe it's possible to bring these together for a common secondary use. Um, other more traditional methodologies include ethics waivers of consent, recontact, data de-identification and anonymization saying, look, we see all of this data, maybe we can't make the data, the, the, the permissions in the data compatible as they are now, but maybe there's a way to change this, either by cutting the Gordian knot um, the whole way through and just de-identifying the data, removing the issues, or by going back to the participants and getting a fresh consent. Um, but I think those are sort of some of the more traditional approaches. What I want to talk to you about today are technological data governance tools. Um, so just like in fields such as bioinformatics or computational genomics, um, there is a litany of information that's being generated and that it's you know, not simply a question of going and looking at the information that's there. It really does become a question of having proper uh, tools computational tools to explore large quantities of information, organize them and understand them, just as this has helped us sort of, uh, you know, deflate the, the, the problems involved in assessing large, large quantities of health information. Similarly, it's, it's my contention that these tools 
um, or these same kinds of tools can be useful in simplifying the problem of data governance in spite of legal, ethical um, complexity, and I think increasing complexity. Um, as many of you probably already know, data governance and data privacy legislation has only become more complex with time. Um, and research has only started to involve more and more institutions, more and more stakeholders. And so it's really necessary to devise and use tools that are, um, you know, sort of computational in nature and capable of parsing through the large quantities of normative information that can apply to data to better understand it. So what kind of technological tools exist today? Um, I think there's maybe two main families of, uh, of tool that I'd like to talk about. And the first one is uh, kinds of tools that are helpful for understanding and expressing the governance conditions that are applicable to data. Um, so many consortia have started to create things like data structures or ontologies for expressing ethical and legal conditions applicable to data in a way that's standardized, meaningfully comparable, and sometimes even machine readable. Um, some of you may be familiar with the automated access and discovery matrices, the data use conditions, the data use ontologies, and the consent codes all of which have been developed by uh, consortia and standard setting bodies. And essentially what these tools are made to do is to attach metadata to data that expresses the governance conditions applicable to the data. Um, the second family of technologies, and these are the ones that really are more in emergence, aren't so much about expressing and understanding the, uh, the data governance conditions that are applicable to the data as they are about really sort of, um, again, cutting that, that Gordian knot and sort of saying, if we can't understand all the governance conditions applicable to this information, maybe we can get the analytical insights out, the research insights out of the data without having to get into that ethical, legal, normative model, so to speak. Um, and so here we think about things like algorithms that can de-identify data and remove direct or ident uh, indirect so really go through large quantities of clinical information, anonymize them, take out names, take out uh, whole genome sequences, things like that. But we can also think of things like secure multi-party computation or, or differential privacy, which are really about saying, let's mathematically show that we're getting the analytical insights out of this data without compromising the identities or the privacy of any of the people who are in that data set. Um, so without being too technical, and I'm, I'm not a technical person myself, um, essentially what these systems do is they parse through large, large quantities of information that tend to be shared across a number of different research institutions without bringing all of the information together in the hands of one institution. So nobody gives up their data, nobody really shares their data, but an algorithm can still go through uh, information that, that belongs to a, a large number of different groups and get the analytical insights that are of interest. Um, I think I'm becoming a little bit pressed for time, so I'm going to move to my, my last slide here. And the, um, I guess the, the cross-cutting message that I really want to get through in this talk is that health organizations, uh, standard setting bodies like the Research Data Alliance, um, amongst others, have an important role to play in building governance tools for health consortia. Uh, a large consortium or a standard setting body is more than just a larger version of a research study or of a research coordinating organization. Um, ideally, entities can act as a form of governance and legal infrastructure for researchers to rely on in making sure that their data can be used for a very long time. Um, so this can be achieved through setting up uh, repositories to shepherd the data for a long time and outfitting them with specialized personnel that are able to help navigate the ethical, legal, normative conundrums applicable to data. Um, and more than that, to invest in the creation of more technologies that can help researchers get access to analytical insights without losing uh, the, the privacy of the individuals whose data is shared. Thanks for your time. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Very great. Thanks, Alexander. Um, so, 
two very different talks showing the the range of issues and conversations in this space so uh i guess it gives us a flavor of uh of uh what's involved here and uh, priyanka did you get your screen sharing worked out or is natalie sharing for you um no. natalie's sharing for me i've posted a couple of questions if we have time to answer those questions one is for natalie and one is for um alexander um, you know what, I'm going to suggest we might consider those towards the end, Priyanka, just yeah. we're about 10 minutes behind, so we have 30 yeah. minutes left, and I want to make sure that we see the outcomes that we were looking for in terms of the community of practice, but if you are if you finish up your piece sooner, then uh, we can certainly go there. Um, so if you want to share the screen there, Natalie. There you go. Um, so uh, Priyanka, Priyanka, of course, as I mentioned at the top, is uh, the um, the spark that led to the infectious disease community of practice effort. And uh, Priyanka is a data specialist for the Melbourne Data Analytics Platform and a health informatics specialist for the Australian Partnership for Preparedness Research on Infectious Disease uh, Emergencies. Um, so Priyanka, I'm going to pass it over to you, and I guess uh, I'll leave it to you how you adjust the time in, in order to accommodate where we are in the schedule. Thanks, Mark. Um, can yep. Thank you. So what I'll do is, because we're running a bit behind, um, oh, I think I lost the audio there for a bit. I hear you. Yeah, we can hear I'm you. Back. Thank you. Um, so what I'll do is, because we're running a bit behind, I'll sort of merge the next two agenda items. So I'll go through the um, draft charter, some of the key points in the draft charter, which is open for feedback and comments. And um, I might post that link again now so people can, can see it. Um, and then if there are any questions, I'm happy to take those questions now and also facilitate a discussion. So I won't. So please feel free to, I don't, I can't see raised hands. You don't have that function, but yes, I'm happy to have a discussion as I, as I read through the charter and, and discuss some of the key points. And I'll let you Thank know you. if there's any. Um, yeah. So can we go to the next slide, please, Natalie? Um, so a bit of a background, I think we've all seen in the past year or so that the amount of data that's generated in order to respond to the pandemic is, is massive. And there's a lot of information that's being generated on a daily basis. And it's, it's really hard to keep up with that, that amount of data. Um, but this is, not, this is not new. It has been happening for quite some time now. And because infectious diseases spans across healthcare settings, community settings, and has a lot, lot, lot of different elements to it, there's always been the issue of big data um, and the, the timeliness of that, that big data and, and what needs to be done with the data as soon as it's collected. So that has been an ongoing um, issue for quite some time now. Um, and the surveillance is one of the most exciting opportunities where uh, one can um, think about the, the level of maturity one can achieve in terms of sharing um, data. So the past health emergencies have also demonstrated the challenges associated with sharing information, as well as shown some key um, examples and some success stories, how sharing data can actually um, facilitate the response and make it more timely and make it more quick. And that's why I keep saying that timeliness is the key. Um, and the ongoing crisis has also highlighted the importance of a coordinated response, but also reinforced the need to have a global community of practice. And one of the reasons why why we're seeing the united efforts, in, not just in this space, but in every other space, is the virus does, the virus doesn't have a boundary. It it has traveled across bound up across uh, countries, across jurisdictions, um, and it is not just a health problem, but it's also a socioeconomic uh, problem, which is why it is important to have diverse voices in this community of practice, have diverse opinions, perspectives, expertise, skills where we can all have a coordinated response um, and build this community of practice that then leads to the development of social and technical infrastructure that can then be adapted to local settings to expedite the collection, sharing, and reuse of data. And when I say the localized settings, I mean 
as if I were to give an example of, of legal frameworks that are quite different depending on the jurisdictions. I mean, in here in Australia, within the states and territories, um, and my view is quite narrow, so I will talk about only Australia. Um, the states and territories have different policies with respect to consent, sharing of information. Um, the information that can be shared during a pandemic. So even within Australia, the diversity of the legal frameworks that enables or acts as a challenge in terms of sharing information tells us that a global community of practice is required, but that global community of practice needs to be adapted to local settings. Can we go to the next slide, Natalie, please? So why do we need this? And as I said before, pandemics are a multidisciplinary issue. It's affecting employment, it's affecting housing, it's affecting mental health, it's affecting and not just the physical health. There's long-term implications to the economy, long-term implications to globalization movement. And there's, there's a lot of information there um, that one needs to to sort of recover. So thinking about the recovery, not that this is over by any means, but thinking about the recovery phase, what would the recovery phase look like for, from, a, from a pandemic? And a lot of us has, most of us in our lifetime, lifetime have not seen such a crisis. Um, and that also highlights the diversity in the information ecosystem not just from the health perspective, but other perspective as well. But if we were to just look at health data and the clinical data, uh, the just the sheer diversity, so clinical data, general practice data, primary care data, there's information coming in from public health practitioners, epidemiologists who are running uh, and driving the response, contact tracing information, global mobility data that's available publicly, sentiment analysis, understanding how people feel about vaccination, understanding how people feel about the public health interventions, there's that, and there's genomics. Genomics has been one of the key factors in driving early, um, the understanding of the spread and understanding of the genetic diversity of the virus. That information was not handy uh, back in, in other pandemics, but it was not at the maturity level that it's at now. Which also brings us to data versioning. So if there's a public health response that's triggered, what is the last version of data that you have access to? When did the data refresh happen? Has thing, have things changed? I mean, here in Australia, it could, it's not exactly data versioning, but I would say there's a lot of concern about smaller numbers of um, cases that we have and the way those cases are reported because a small number, a small jump from say a, a 10 to 20 could trigger a massive public health response. Did, do we have access to up-to-date information? That's where the timeliness, real time is the key there. And that's why data versioning is, is at that point is important. The versioning of the information, the timestamps and the accuracy is, is quite important. And like I said, there's local and international implications. We need to drive the dialogue for the practitioners, as this has been raised a couple of times before in this conversation, that there are busy practitioners who are otherwise, on, on the best of the days, are hard pressed for time. They don't have time to engage in, in discussions where they can write lots of texts about um, enabling access to data. They need to do what they need to do in order to keep the community safe. And during a pandemic, it would be difficult for any kind of practitioner, whether it's a clinician or an epidemiologist working at, um, say, the CDC or Departments of Health, to um, facilitate a dialogue or drive the message that we need to share data. Because at that point, the priority is to contain the spread. At that point, the priority is to keep the community safe. There's also a need for knowledge base. And that's, um, if I were to give an example from Australia, at the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of information that was scattered all over the internet. And we, um, a couple of um, collaborators, we did a sort of um, a survey or, or just asking clinicians and frontline responders what the key priority is in terms of information. And the key, key priority was to have up-to-date access to information in a visual way and not buried in the internet, people going through many, many links and to find what's what's out there. Um, and that's where the, the community of practice aims to build a knowledge base as well. Um, can you move on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, and this aligns with the RDA mission and vision. So it's a framework for collaboration. It aims to go across the geographical and domain boundaries and help develop a common understanding of infectious disease data management and when I say common, again, acknowledging that jurisdictions are different, domains are different, but just a common understanding of what the data management should look like globally, whether it's to do with harmonization, data versioning, uh, 
governance tools and, and legal frameworks that enable sharing of information, which then can be adapted locally. Um, this community of practice will also enable collaborations uh, to address key challenges in the area of infectious disease data management and facilitate important conversations between researchers, practitioners, and the community. And the grand vision is to build social and technical um, platforms and infrastructure to make this happen. Can we move on to the next slide? Natalie, thank you. Um, and engagement with existing work in this area. So we're aiming to augment the work done by the RDA COVID-19. And Natalie gave a fantastic talk. And there was a lot of work done there. And I also acknowledge that this community of practice may not move at the same speed um, as, as the COVID-19 working group did, because at that point, there was a lot going on. And we had to produce guidelines straight away. And it was a response. It was a rapid response. But this community of practice will move at a slower pace, but try and have a broader remit, bring a lot of people on board in terms of the, the key voices that we need, um, organize more interactive sessions. That's something that I'm very keen to do. I don't know how that would work, given that we're still in a virtual setting. But that would be really good if we can organize workshops, brainstorming sessions. Um, new interest groups and working groups, groups could uh, spin off from this um, uh, community of practice. Um, and we're also pr pr proposing localized adoption of the international community of practice, interactions with key stakeholder organizations. We also propose partnerships with discipline, domain-specific funding opportunities with industry associations, organizations, um, and media. Can we move on to the next slide, Natalie, please? So what are the proposed outcomes? Um, and because this draft is still open for feedback, I, I do acknowledge sometimes I tend to get carried away and come up with uh, amazing outputs that I feel we can achieve, but sometimes things are not very reasonable. Um, and I, I think as we go forward, the, the draft will change, the charter will change, and the proposed outcomes. Some people will give me a reality check that, no, this is something you can't achieve in 16 to 18 months. And at that point, the, the draft will obviously undergo some changes. So what are the proposed outcomes? Um, so we, what we want to do is identify key international and local leaders and change agents who would be keen to be actively involved in this community of practice. Um, I'm aware of non-clinicians and non-public health practitioners, at least here in Australia, who are not directly associated with the clinical domain or the health domain, but are working in the area of infectious diseases, which is a very interesting space to be in because they are investigating the social um, elements of it, the, the economic challenges associated with infectious diseases. So someone like uh, those people who wouldn't otherwise directly be involved in the response, but are interested in this space. Also identify key priorities in the infectious diseases research community with respect to data and information management. And like I said before, I'm very keen to organize workshops and interactive information sessions with infectious disease researchers, doctors, clinicians, practitioners, data specialists, stakeholders, community representatives to achieve outcome, um, the, the, the second one. And again, also make sure that we're interacting with vulnerable communities who are negatively and more severely impacted by these kind of uh, health emergencies and also during infectious, the, the routine the life before this pandemic happened. Um, and also make sure that we engage with community leaders who represent those communities. Document a list of current data holdings and resources held and utilized by infectious diseases data researchers, practitioners, collaborators, networks, and decision makers. And speaking from personal experience, sometimes there's so much to do during the response, it's very hard to keep track of all the information that's floating out, out there, but it's critical for response. The other set of proposed outcomes is to identify existing data definitions, standards, formats, repositories, from the resources that are currently informing the pandemic response and that also support routine research. Um, whether it's uh, understanding different uh, ways one diagnoses the, the disease, what are the key indicators of disease, how do you measure quarantining periods. So there's a, as of now, we're seeing a lot of information that changes also regularly as new evidence emerges. But that would look slightly different during routine research because at that point there's enough evidence there to uh, come up with a standardized definitions. But I think the COP can facilitate that discussion. The COP can um, act as a knowledge base for those definition standards and formats. Um, and map the variations from um, the data definition standards that were identified to develop recommendations to make the data and systems more um, interoperable. 
and then identify the analytical tools, methods that actively support the processing of infectious diseases data during routine race and during emergencies, which is also not restricted to um, the health and science domain, which also includes sentiment analysis, analyses using publicly available data, globality, a global mixing up words. It's 2 a.m. here in Australia, <laughs> in my defense. Global mobility data that informs whether or not lockdown measures are successful, whether or not people movement has reduced, and whether or not that actually has an impact of case numbers going down. Um, and then identify the data elements required to inform response and identify gaps in the data collection process. Um, next slide, please, Natalie. And then map those data elements that we've identified that inform response to a decision and that inform response to a decision-making tree. Now, this decision-making tree will contain provenance, licensing, contextual metadata to identify the data owners, where the data is being generated, with whom the data will be shared, how the data will help inform response, and then we can develop a blueprint for infectious disease data management and analytics platform. So the operational mechanism is this community of practice will aim to meet and i promise i will drive it a lot more <laughs> um, and a lot the other co-chairs involved will all aim to drive it more um, meet more frequently our case statement is live now and i think the second draft looks pretty good which also um, will drive this uh, community of practice further so we're aiming to meet every three to four weeks virtually the meeting times will be alternated to accommodate multiple time zones i would like to meet at a time where i don't have to sacrifice my sleep um, we will use Google Docs and slides where we can um, develop our documentation and we can use that for communication as well. The idea is to develop a, a blueprint, like I said, um, and I think that keeping that in the forefront will be quite uh, critical for us to remember that this is the endpoint that we're getting at. We want to facilitate data management as well as data analytics. And the, co uh, the community of practice chairs will regularly engage with the RDA Secretariat to ensure the goals and outcome of this community of practice align with other efforts. We're also aiming to meet with other organizations that are actively establishing platforms and practices in the area of infectious diseases. Once the case statement is available for comments, um, this group will organize information sessions for the RDA community. And I think that those information sessions will also focus on the other, uh, on, on the conversations that we're having with other stakeholders and other organizations that are doing similar work and how we can support, augment, or be complementary to their work. Um, the, the idea is to identify additional co-chairs as well who are interested in leading this community of practice, call, put out the call for um, new members, share the draft, cha uh, draft charter with group members, send the community of practice case statement to stakeholders and public health consortia like WHO, um, ICODA, which is a platform, HDR UK and Glopida, requesting letters of support, uh, release the final uh, community of practice a statement for community feedback followed by endorsement. Or oh, I could have gotten that order wrong. I'm sorry. Um, I know Hillary's on the call. And sorry, Mary, if I got that order wrong. We also are aiming to engage with RDA community members to identify themes of interest and priority areas for focus and discussion. So we can we can have a structure in the community of practice, and then we can have themes, and like we did in the RDA COVID-19 group. Um, and then we are aiming to engage with other stakeholders. We then want to launch the community of practice after the endorsement, make the case statement publicly available, um, establish mailing list, organize meeting times, establish key milestones during the 18 month timeline and organize information sessions. We also want to prepare documents and reports as indicated in the output section, outcome section, and share it broadly with the community in line with RDA's policy of openness. We also want to routinely monitor and assess the progress of the group until the end of the 18 month period and then identify next steps for the community of practice. That's all from my end. Um, I think I took up a bit more time, but happy to open this up for discussion. Thanks, Natalie. Or Priyanka, sorry. <laughs> it's, not as early, it's not as early for me, so I don't have the same excuse. Um, <laughs> So Priyanka has outlined the, you know, kind of the kernels from the uh, case statement. And one of the key goals of this exercise is to determine how best to proceed. And the folks that have gathered on this particular call, um, any suggestions you have and how you would like to see, uh, to see these efforts proceed. So my, Temptation would be to just kind of open up the floor on that 
part of the conversation. Um, and whether you're a speaker or otherwise, feel free to ask a question in chat or Q&A or just unmute yourself and uh, let us know if you have any thoughts or comments. And uh, while people are thinking about that, I will kind of go back to the, my original point about IGAD, which is the uh, kind of a similar group, if you will, to what's desired here in the context of agricultural data. And that group has been active since the beginning of RDA, I think since the very first meeting. So they've had, in essence, the same kind of timeline in which to uh, carry out a range of activities. And uh, so we have two very different approaches to communities of practice, one creating it from scratch and the other from a lot of the work that has gone on before. So any thoughts or comments on moving forward? I might have uh, one very quick thought and it's to pick up on something that Priyanka said specifically about the idea of you know, not just having a group, but also hopefully eventually moving to having some kind of platform. Um, and I think that in a sense that's important because really I think that the best standard setting bodies and the best groups for sort of, you know, building things like these have an approach and also have a model. And I think that can breed a lot of other groups either coming in um, and contributing to the existing model, building upon what's there or adopting it themselves, more so than just having one or just having the other would do. So I, I, I realize it's an ambitious proposal, but I, I really liked that, that you included that, Priyanka. Yeah, good, uh, good, thanks, Alexander. And I noticed, I think it was Romain who, there you go. Did you have a comment? Hi, yes, just a comment about the Committee of Practice formats. I don't know very well this format, but thanks for your presentations. Uh, it's highlighting uh, some uh, uh, great things for the for, for the outputs. I'm really interested by the outputs and by participating, but not as a co-chair because I think I will never have the time. I'm involved in a European research infrastructure on highly pathogenic agents, and we are building several uh, research programs on, on, on uh, data management on this subject. So I think that it could be great to have something like correspondent members that could be active members to join all these uh, these uh, demarches and these programs to the, to the community of practice. I don't know what you think about this idea. Uh, yeah, no, it sounds good. Uh, Roman, uh, Priyanka, did you want to comment or? So it does sound like a, like a good suggestion, taking that on board. Um, and there are kind of elements of what Romain just commented on in Rob's question, and, sh and that is that, you know, should the community of practice spin out working groups, um, uh, discuss gaps with other interest groups, um, as he highlighted, the agriculture one started at an interest group, as an interest group, and then spun out several wor working groups. So that's certainly... Um, uh, is a good suggestion. And then uh, Rob also highlights Priyanka's mentioning the versioning uh, interest group. So I think that does point to um, the fact that the uh, community of practice is a long term conversation with a range of activities. And I think for the next, I can imagine, I don't know, Priyanka, what your thoughts were timeline but i would say for the next year i can see the group discussing uh key interests and determining what kinds of working groups or work packages they might define uh what, did you have particular thoughts in mind priyanka in terms of for example romaine or uh, rob's suggestions about particular activities um, I think that's that's really valuable, I and mean, that's how I envisage this community of practice to go ahead as well, to actually um, spin off interest groups or working groups, and then have specific outcomes in in mind. Because this one community of practice can't do everything, 
um, I think um, my my understanding and my vision is that the community of Pakistan sit there as an enabler and a facilitator of these dialogues and brings diverse voices together. But when there is a key priority area, which could be say developing. Um, developing resources on specimen sharing, facilitating specimen sharing across borders. That's a very specific issue, which then ties into governance of samples, governance, uh, the information that sits on top of the samples, the metadata that sits on top of the samples, of those, of those samples, uh, harmonization of those samples. Then that can spin off into a working group. That's how I look at it, which then can work with other stakeholders who have similar interests and want to develop some um, framework like the, the Nagoya protocol, the way that protocol exists, something like that for data as well, uh, and augment the work of the of Nagoya, Nagoya protocol that facilitates specimen sharing and sample sharing all over the world by specimen sharing. That's how I look at it, With depending on the key priorities and uh, key challenges that people identify, we could have interest groups or working groups that could work, work, work towards that. And I see in the Q&A, Samuel has uh, asked if there's rep representation from the Global South, uh, certainly unique ethical issues and concerns there. And I think at this early stage, I'm actually not sure, uh, but uh, any thoughts or comments on that other than that would be something to build up? Um, there, you know, there is also obviously a strong intersection with a couple of the SDGs, sustainable development goals, which uh, was talked about uh, in a session yesterday, I believe. Um, so that's another way I think to intersect with um, various communities uh, across the globe and to increase, uh, I would imagine that this would be a quite a great deal of interest this community of practice like this to uh, colleagues in uh, other countries for sure. And Hillary highlighted that that was a discussion in the ICOTA group as well. Um, any thoughts since uh, Hillary mentioned ICOTA, any particular thoughts people might have on intersecting with or otherwise engaging with other uh, groups like ICOTA? Glopidar and the other ones that Priyanka mentioned. I suppose it's a strategy to develop. Um, now we just, we have only six minutes left, and uh, so Priyanka, I'm sensitive to any particular uh, outcomes or next steps that you want to extract from here or any advice you want from colleagues that are gathered was there anything else in particular that you can think of i think the feedback on the case statement would be would be quite useful so i've enabled uh, the comments people can comment those who have link can comment on the case statement so that would be really useful this is again like i said very ambitious set of outcomes that i i think we can achieve but happy to get a reality check that this is not the this doesn't fit within the remit of a community of practice i think the outcomes part is really really the key because that sets the tone for what we will do in the next right. 12 to 18 months so that would be really useful if people can look at the case statement or reach out to me if there's anything specific that people are concerned about um and we can i can we can discuss i can organize a meeting that, and we can discuss that and uh Hillary, maybe, or Mary, I'm not sure which one. What What are the kind of the next steps? The case statement has been kind of promoted here, and we've asked colleagues to comment on it. What would be the process or the timeline for community review and then submission to uh, RDA? Uh, well, it's uh, no, it's uh, community review will be six weeks when we go, when we get it in the secretariat. So it's like a working or an interest group, uh, except it's slightly longer because of the size of the initiative. So instead of four weeks, it's six weeks. It goes out for public comment through the thing, and then it goes through the procedure to, uh, we have, if there are any comments, they go back to you. We ask tab and then eventually council. We will try and fast track them, but the six weeks uh, win time frame is 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 fixed. Yeah. So when does that six weeks start? 
when it's officially submitted with the, the letters of support, et cetera, to the secretariat. Oh, gotcha. yeah. So bear in mind that you can get people to comment. That's when you get your feedback on the case statement too. I, I appreciate that if you get it done now, you will you know, obviously get more. Yeah. But, um, and, and perhaps what we could do if you want the, to do that is try and highlight the, the, the fact that it's open for pre-community review now. Uh, also, if, if you're open to that, the Secretariat can definitely help there. Okay. And we've discussed this before that the case statement then being sent to stakeholders and partner organizations will help them provide letters of support. So as soon as this case statement is, has reached a shareable format and looks good and uh, app captures everything that we want to do, uh, we can then open it up for, uh, we can send that to the partner organizations right. and other consortia for letters of support. So for that then, I'm, we're thinking, we're probably talking about two, three weeks for people to comment, at least those on this call, so we can incorporate their feedback and then produce a somewhat penultimate version that could go to potential partners for letters of support and then their comments and feedback might result in further edits that then goes to council. So two to three weeks from now. Yeah. So mid May. Yes, I noted Rob's funny cop cop. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. <laughs> We will, uh, we will note your COVID pandemic community of practice. Maybe I could say one other thing as well. It's about the community, the practice for us that are a new thing, as we all know, and I get, as you rightly pointed out, are in a completely different situation. Priyanka referred to the 18 month cycles uh, a bit. Of course, uh, th that that is really because we want to see, are they still valid? And it's a, it's a way for us to kind of have parameters around them but i think that we will be very flexible as well and because i we realize that what you put in now will may change very much you know over the next period as well so bear that in mind too because that there will be flexibility about changing it around i think okay so those that are still on the call and any colleagues you're in touch with if you could encourage them to take a look at the version two of the draft case statement, which you all have the link for, then that's the next step. And then um, I guess we'll probably try to have a call of the <clears throat> co-chairs to try and determine next steps in terms of getting some letters of support. Um, Praka, any final words as we wrap up in the last minute here? Just wanted to thank all the speakers um, today and and everything, all the effort that everyone's been putting in and all the fantastic work that people are sharing here. Just wanted to thank everyone and looking forward to um, positive feedback from the community and looking forward to people's comments on the case statement and taking this community of practice forward. Indeed. And uh, just to Romaine's question, we will make sure that there is a, a mail out uh, to everybody who's filled in the table and uh so thanks for all for your participation and for priyanka for getting this moving and staying up till whatever it is australian time <laughs> all right thanks everyone we'll be in touch thank you thanks everyone thank bye um anything else you want to touch on priyanka before we hang up um, I think just the, uh, like I said, I think the case statement between the 